given by Anelli uh, on the paper entitled on the course of class imbalance and conflicting uh, metrics with machine learning for site channel evaluation. Anelli, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sabo, for the introduction. Yeah, so as you can see from the long title, actually my talk will be divided into two parts. So first I will talk about imbalanceness of classes or of labels, and the second part will be about um, evaluation metrics. So this is a joint work with Stefan, Alan, Shivam, and Francesco. Um, <coughs> so luckily, um, Stefan already told a bit about the big picture, but so we have a profiling phase, an attacking phase, and before we introduced uh, machine learning to the field of side channel um, analysis, we mainly had template attack and the stochastic approach. So what we do here is uh, build probability density distributions in the training. We ev evaluate them in the um, attacking phase, and then we evaluate the whole um, concept with evaluation metrics like guessing entropy and success rate. And then machine learning techniques have been introduced to the field um, so, he, so in this talk, I will mainly talk about the classical machine learning techniques, so like SVM, support vector machines, random forest. Um, <coughs> um, and so, so we use these techniques to train and then also to predict, so in the attacking phase. But then also accuracy came into the game of such an analysis. So accuracy is a really popular metric in, in machine learning. And in this talk, I will first talk about what can, might go wrong with your labels in combination with machine learning, and also what is wrong with accuracy in the field of um, side channel. So what is a label? So typically, what we attack in, in this context is intermediate states of a cryptographic algorithm. So here, for example, let's assume we have IS. Um, we would normally attack the either the first round or the last round. So for the first round, I would um, have the um, output of the S-box, so I have some known part which comes from the plain text, and some part which um, I want to, to reveal, this would be the key. And a really common model in side channel is actually to use the Hemming weight. <coughs> so what is the problem with the Hemming weight is that it, it introduces actually imbalanceness in the data set. So if I have uniformly distributed data, if I compute the Hemming weight, I will actually end up with binomial distributed data. So here's an example. If I have an 8-bit value, how it would look like. Um, <coughs> so here we can see that Hemming weight class 4 is actually occurring like 70, um, 70 times, whereas the um, class 0 or 8 is only um, occurring like once. So I really have a high distribution or a high occurrence in the middle, whereas on the, on the ends we have much less occurrences. So why do we use actually Hemming weight in the field of side channel or for, for power analysis and electromagnetic emanation? Um, actually, it does not really reflect um, how the device is leaking. So here I plotted the influence of each bit to the power consumption, or in this case, is, it is EM. So if I would have a Hemming, a Hemming weight leakage, I would see that each bit is actually contributing similarly um, or have the same amplitude. So this I can only see in the first part, whereas the other two parts, they don't look like Hemming weight at all. And here, actually, so the amplitude really reflects the influence to the leakage. So these two parts where it's not Hemming weight is leaking much more than the part where we actually have Hemming weight. So why do we still use it? <clears throat> First of all, it really reduces the complexity of training. For in the attacking, we don't care so much because we have to attack the key anyway, but in the learning phase, it, it really makes a difference if I just have to compute um, my model to distinguish between nine classes for 8-bit or 256, and especially if I use machine learning techniques like SVM. And the other point is that actually it works sufficiently good in many scenarios. So if I want to attack, I don't really want to model the leakage, so I have a precise representation. What I want to do is to distinguish classes. So I need some function where I can easily classify between the classes. And here what I plotted is the outcome of template attack in the Hemming weight model versus template attack in the value model. And on the x-axis, you see, can see the number of traces I want to attack with. And on the y-axis, the number of traces I need in the profiling phase in order to reach a guessing entropy below 10. 
So how can you read this graph? So let, let's assume we want to attack um, five traces, so like here. Um, then for, if I, if I um, for template attack with the Hemming rate model, I would need around 100 traces, whereas for the template attack with the value model, I need nearly 1,000 traces. So it is much more efficient to use the Hemming rate model with the same outcome in the attacking phase. Of course, if I want to attack just with one or two, or in this case, three traces, I need to use the value model because the Hemming rate model reduces information on the key. But if I, if I have, for example, in this case again, if I have like 50 traces, actually the, the outcome is nearly still the same, but still in the training phase, it is much more efficient just to compute the model. So in many cases, Hemming rate model is not such a bad idea actually. And this gap between these two, we saw that if we, if we, are, in a, if we are in a higher noise scenario, um, this gap actually becomes bigger. So even that Hemming rate is not representing the leakage, it's not, it's not bad actually. But why do we care about imbalancedness in the data at all? It's because most machine learning techniques, and here again I talk about SVM and random forest, not so much for, for deep learning techniques, they rely on loss functions that are actually designed to maximize accuracy. So what does this mean? So accuracy I will talk a bit in the end more, but <coughs> let's assume we are in a high noise scenario. And I have um, the best strategy, actually, if I cannot really distinguish between the classes, the best strategy would be to always predict Hemming rate class four because it's mostly populated. And actually in 27% of the case, I will be right. But if I always predict Hemming rate class four, we will not be able to attack. So we will have, have no information about the key. So even though the accuracy will be quite high, it will not help us to attack to, re to actually reveal the secret key. Um, so what do we do? So in this paper, we um, looked for methods how we can transform the data set actually to achieve balancedness. So what could we do? Either we throw away data, so I will explain that afterwards, we add data, or we actually choose data before we do all this. But for this, you, you really, you, what we came up with is not uniformly distributed plain text, and if you want to attack first and the last round, it will, will get really messy. <coughs> so throw away data. This is called random undersampling. So we will only keep the number of samples equal to the least populated class. But the problem here is we have the binomial distribution. So it's not like some classes are more populated than others, just slightly. We really have this distribution where we have a lot of data in the middle and only really minimal data on the outer classes. So we will throw a lot of data away. So here I really made a toy example. This is not uh, non-distributed. You know, um, so class one has seven samples, class two has 13 samples, and what we will do, we just throw away um, six samples from class two, and they are balanced. The second thing we tried is random oversampling with replacement. So here we <coughs> randomly select samples from the original data set until the amount is actually equal to the largest populated one. A really simple method and it works quite uh, well. It was reported to work quite well in other contexts. So we said, okay, let's try this out also. But it may happen that some samples are not selected at all or some are selected more often. So here what we would do is have certain samples, but they are not really distinct certain samples. Just the weight of the two um, classes would be the same. So here we would have one sample, for example, which is not selected, um, two are which are selected three times and so on. And another technique we tried is a SMOTE, so this stands for Synthetic Minority Oversampling Technique. So here we really add artificial samples, so it's really adding data by new samples. And these data is gen generated to the, K, uh, the, the Euclidean distance um, of K nearest neighbors. So here how it would look like, we really add, we really would have certain samples, um, <coughs> distinct certain samples. And the last technique we tried is SMOTI plus um, edited nearest neighbor. So it's SMOTI plus the data cleaning technique. So it's we mm -hmm. first oversample for the um, classes we need to oversample and then undersample. So here we would remove data 
where we, we saw that the k nearest neighbors actually have different classes. So we clean data. So here, in this case, we may up, come up with only 10 samples in both classes. So unfortunately, I, I don't have time to show you all the results we have in the paper, but just to, um, the most effective technique in our cases was SMOTI. And I will show you now the experience for this. And I just want to say that, th so this is data augmentation, so we add data where we need it. And, but we don't use any specific knowledge about data set, implementation, protection, um, distributions. It's just we, we add data acor uh, um, according to the neighbors. And we did this for a varying number of samples in the profiling phase. So it's like in the imbalance case, we had 1K, 10K, and 50K. And this end up together with motive for 5K, 24K, and 120K. So um, the data sets are the same as, um, or three of them, are the same as in the talk from Stefan. So the first data set is on the DPA counter 3.4. Um, here we assume that the mask is known. Actually, it's a protected um, implementation mode is used, but we assume the mask is known. And I plotted the densities of each Hemming weight. And you can see that they are somehow look Gaussian. And you can easily distinguish between them. And then, actually, to make it really short, in this, um, for this data set, um, Smoti did not help at all. <coughs> but this is also um, really natural, because if we can already distinguish the classes easily, like you can see on this picture, there's no need for the distinguisher to say, oh, we always have Hemingway class 4. So we don't actually um, need this added sample. So let's come to more interesting results. So here's the data set um, 2. We have a um, um, FPJ on the Zazibu G2. Again, IS128. And you can already see that the densities are not looking so Gaussian anymore for most cases. And they're quite overlapping. So we have much more noise. <coughs> and in this case, first of all, all the time, or how you can read this graph first. So we performed SVM, random forest, for these three different um, training data sets. Well, everything what is in balance is like a straight line, and what is with Smoti is like a, a dashed line. And we can see that actually in all cases, in all scenarios, ad adding artificial data, so sm using Smoti helps. Um, quite quite drastically. What we can also see is that SVM and random forest just using 1K, with the blue and the purple line, they didn't converge until the 25,000 um, 25, um, measurements we used in the, uh, in the checking phase. But the small thing, they performed actually better than the highest number we had uh, in the profiling phase. So what this tells us is if you have a data set, it's better to stop um, before, then do a bal balancing technique instead of taking more measurements and still be in the imbalancing um, scenario. And the third data set is the one with the random um, delay countermeasure. You can see that we have much more noise. They all look more like Gaussian and they are overlapping. And also in this case, we see that adding um, artificial sample with Smote actually improved a lot. We have further results in the paper and also more explanations in the paper. Unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you all, but we also used it for CNN, MLP, and template attack. But of course, if you have the chance to already choose your data set and have perfectly, perfectly balancedness um, of real measurements, then it, of course it is better than by artificially adding samples to achieve balance. So let's now come to the second part, part about accuracy. So on the side channel side, we have success rate and guessing entropy. And this is um, um, the average estimated probability of success, or the average estimated, um, key, esti estimated um, secret key rank. And here we really have a dependence on the number of um, <coughs> traces in the attacking phase. And the important thing is that the average is actually computed over the experiment. So for independent data sets, hopefully independent with different keys and on different traces, we compute the average. 
Whereas on the other side, the accuracy, which is the average estimated probability of correct classification, the average is not computed over the experiments, but just on one experiment over the number of traces. Ah, that's actually, <laughs> I'm sorry, there's a uh, mistake in the copy. <laughs> Check it out in the paper. So there's no actual translation um, between the, the two. And what, what we can say is that there's an indication if um, the accuracy is high, then also guessing at entropy and success rate should converge quite quick, quickly. But again, there's no real conversion between the two of them. In the case for this, we, um, we named it um, because of two reasons. The, first of all, we have global accuracy versus class accuracy. What this means is that um, if we have a bijective function between the class and the key, so for example, if we use the Hemming weight, then it, is more, it, give, it, then it gives us more information to, for example, predict a Hemming weight class zero or eight, then it will give us to predict Hemming weight class four, uh, four. Because for four, we still have 70 possible key guesses, whereas for Hemingway class zero or one, it's just one possible key guess. So it is much more important to classify correctly classes with, with low population than the ones which are more populated. But accuracy actually doesn't care over the, um, of this. It will just average over each class accuracy. And the second um, thing is that we have lab, uh, label versus fixed key prediction. So, and this is only relevant if we want to attack with more than one trace, because for, for accuracy, we consider each trace independently, but for guessing entropy, like I said before, we actually accumulate knowledge over the whole um, data set. So there, there are much more detailed formulas, explanation in, this, in the paper on this. Please, please check it out. So I think um, the takeaway, there are two takeaway messages from the talk. So if you have Hemming weight or Hemming distance, plus the machine learning algorithm and noise, this is really, really likely to go wrong. To go wrong. Um, and data sampling techniques really help. And it is more effective to stop earlier than balance than just take more measurements and keep it unbalanced. And the second thing is that machine learning metrics, accuracy and metrics which are similar to accuracy, do not really give a precise uh, SCR evaluation. And this has two reasons of what I <coughs> briefly um, showed you it's a global versus class accuracy and label versus fixed key prediction. So, thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. <coughs> thank you, Anneli, for this informative and <coughs> nice talk. I was, uh, I, I enjoyed a lot. <laughs> uh, if there is any question for Anneli, please come to the micro. Can I have a question about how can you make the data balance? Uh, in my opinion, uh, Hemingway, uh, the nature of picture of Hemingway is imbalanced because Hemingway number four will have uh, the most, something like a uh, nearly a half, and Hemingway number zero and eight will have only one uh, among the all. So in, in if you have one key, uh, you, ha you can have, you can choose only one plain text, I mean uh, for eight bit uh, sub key, you have one sub, one eight bit sub key, you can choose only one plain text to match with it for having weight eight or having weight zero. So if you make balance, how many data will you have in your data set and how can you increase it in that, in that case? I, I don't know if I understood correctly, but you said two, two, two bits, two classes, or, and how many I need? I, I, yes, um, I mean, how can you make the data set in, in that case because for one 8-bit key, you have only one 8-bit plain text that can match together to make timing weight zero. So the amount of sample decrease, significantly decrease, and how can you make a big data set enough to, 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 to do the training? Maybe we can discuss uh, later in oh. more detail. I, I, I think I because uh, really the time is restricted, it's good to uh, take it offline. Uh, is there any uh, quick uh, question for Anneli? So I have a quick question for you myself. Um, uh, 
for this uh, swing technique that uh, you said, you said that you have generated synthetic data. Yes. How those uh, synthetic data have been uh, generated? Yes, so this, for, for the smooth, I mean, there exist, we only tried also a subset of the method which really exists. So I think there are much more in the field of machine learning you can try. But here we used uh, actually five nearest uh, neighbors and then um, looked for the Euclidean distance between them and added this sample. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. But yeah. there exist many more and in, in, in some scenarios they might work more efficient. So and we don't want to claim that this is the best, but just that but the that concept. That's a very good example yeah. showing that it's possible. Exactly. Let's thank uh, Anneli again and